the News 8 Update with David Margulies, Midge Hill, Jim Littleton with weather, followed by Dale Hanson Sports Special. The helicopter uh, covered over the tower with his uh, safety nets. Uh, we brought the victim out to the top hatch of the tower. Plano firemen teamed up with Dallas police in a dramatic rescue effort this afternoon. Officers say the rescue went smoothly, even though they had never practiced the maneuver before. The incident began at around 1 this afternoon, a workman helping to sandblast a water tower at Lexington and Premier Drive, just west of Highway 75, fell 30 feet to the bottom of the tower. Plano firemen were called to get the seriously injured man to safety. Firemen knew they had a problem as soon as they arrived on the scene. They had to bring the seriously injured man through a tiny door in the tower and lower him 130 feet to the ground. It's possible to get neck injuries, back injuries. Uh, so we had to immobilize him, uh, put him in a stoke basket to move him so he wouldn't uh, traumatize his injuries any further. Firemen needed help, and a few minutes later it was hovering over the scene. A Dallas police helicopter with a rescue net waving below. Paramedics Bob Mason and Mike Roberts were on top of the tower. The helicopter pilot was real smooth. Everything he did, he did real well. You know, he hovered well. He didn't move us around much. And uh, when we lifted off, it was just uh, a real smooth operation all the way. Roberts rode the basket down. Ride down was probably uh, one of the most exciting uh, experiences I've had around here anyway. It was kind of like going over the top of the double ferris wheel, maybe at the state fair, and it was reminding me of. Plano has had a long-standing mutual aid agreement with Dallas, but firemen say they had never practiced this maneuver. Tonight they are praising the skill of Dallas police pilot Steve Jones, saying it would have taken another hour or more to rescue the injured workman without the helicopter. Tonight the victim, 32-year-old Josiah Price of San Antonio, is in serious but stable condition at Plano General Hospital. Police have now called off their search of Lake Ray Hubbard for a man who drove into the water. Dallas police are calling it an accident, but witnesses aren't so sure. Channel 8's Gloria Compass reports. The search was underway tonight for an unidentified white man in his early 20s. Witnesses say the blue Camaro he was driving was eastbound on Highway 67 when the car flew over the guardrail blowing out a tire traveling 142 feet before plunging upside down into the lake. Witness Jerry Curtis of Heath was westbound, but he saw the car fly into the lake, so he stopped to see if he could help. I got him back up to the bank up here, top of the hill, and this lady asked him, said, you want to wear my jacket? And he said, no, thank you. And uh, so he, uh, I told someone, I said, someone, would you please go call the police? this lady said yeah I'll go Kyle and I looked back and the kid dove back into the lake he never did come up again Curtis says it took rescue units about 12 minutes to get to the scene but he says it was already too late park police dragged the lake as Dallas police talked to witnesses hoping to come up with more clues then as traffic was stopped wrecking crews pulled the car out of the lake Police were hoping they would find some evidence in the car or beneath it, but that didn't happen. About two hours into the search, skin divers were called in to comb the murky cold waters, but they failed to find a body. Witnesses believe the man deliberately ran his car into the water, but police say they'll call it an accident pending further investigation. The car is registered to a Rockwall woman, and police are hoping she'll be able to shed some light on who was driving her car tonight and why that car ended up in Lake Ray Hubbard. Gloria Campos, Channel 8 News. A man accused of two murders who has been on the loose since Friday is back behind bars tonight. 24-year-old George Douglas Cole surrendered to police in Bryan today at the home of his parents. Cole had been taken from jail to a Denton hospital on Friday night for treatment of an injured finger, but for some unknown reason, the deputy guarding him passed out and Cole took off running down the hospital corridor. He's charged with the murders of 24-year-old Charles Dvorak and 23-year-old Emily Kiever in Louisville 10 days ago. An argument during a game of dominoes left a Fort Worth man dead and police looking for his killer tonight. 
Homicide detectives say Alfred Gray and another man had a fight last night at this Southside home. The dispute apparently erupted again this morning while the two men were playing dominoes. Police say Gray was shot several times with a pistol. He ran to his car and returned with a shotgun, but authorities say Gray was close to death and never fired a shot. He was later pronounced dead at JPS Hospital. Police have now issued an arrest warrant for the 50-year-old suspect in that killing. Several Fort Worth families are homeless tonight after a fire destroyed four units in their apartment complex. Fire officials say the two-alarm fire last night at the Willows Apartments was started by a three-year-old child playing with a lighter in a closet. Authorities say there were no injuries, but several families lost all their possessions to the heavy smoke. It's estimated the fire caused at least $200,000 damage. A Fort Worth fire investigator says at least two of the units were not equipped with smoke detectors. Fire officials say a citation will be issued. And a woman and five of her children are dead tonight in Chicago after an early morning fire roared through their apartment building. Firefighters narrowly escaped disaster when a stairwell collapsed as they tried to rescue people trapped on the third floor. Four people were injured and a firefighter suffered a heart attack. Officials suspect arson. And Chicago's 430,000 public school students will be back in the classroom tomorrow morning. The Teachers Coalition voting tonight overwhelmingly to end the two-week-long strike. Approval of the contracts will give the teachers a 4.5% pay hike. Technically, 28,000 rank-and-file teachers still must ratify the agreement, which is expected to be ratified shortly. The air traffic controllers who took over when strikers were fired are now airing the same complaints. They say the stress is too much. That story still to come on the weekend update. Plus, Muse Air could use a good Santa right now. And Jim is keeping a close eye on the weather situation. Please stay with us. The Great American Railroads. They were built to cut coast-to-coast -coast travel from five months to one week and open up the West. That pioneer spirit made this country grow. Today, I see that same spirit and energy in hundreds of small to mid-sized companies whose new ideas, new jobs, and new technologies will continue to build America. At First Jersey Securities, we specialize in discovering these emerging growth companies for today's investors with vision. First Jersey Securities, come grow with us. Big news. There's a brand new supermarket that gives you what none of the four biggest in Dallas, Fort Worth can. A lower total food bill. Lower than Kroger. Lower than Safeway. Lower than Tom Thumb. And lower than Skaggs Alpha Beta. In fact, Albertson's prices are so low every day, they don't even have to run newspaper specials. Albertson's, now open in Richardson and Plano. JR, you're not going to need Dallas. Ewing Oil is going to be an international power. And if you haven't had sex with Miss Leslie Stewart, it means the lady doesn't want you. Not that you haven't tried. You might be losing your touch. Do you see that man? I don't see anyone. I think I'm being followed. Who said anything about overthrowing a foreign government? I think you just did. Someday everybody will know J.R. Ewing's been here. It's Dallas, Monday at 3, followed by Name That Tune on Channel 8. A new study has found the same old song, Second Verse, is being played by the nation's air traffic controllers. The controllers who replaced those fired by President Reagan in 1981 say they're overworked by a system stretched to its limits. As Channel 8's Brad Watson reports, former controllers say that's no surprise. Here you strip Sierra Hotel 031 in. The complaints are the same heard more than three years ago. The duties of an air traffic controller are strenuous, there aren't enough people to pull the load, and management is autocratic and insincere. However, those comments are current, made by controllers interviewed last summer during a study by an FAA task force. Controllers are working so much because there aren't enough of them, according to the FAA. Administrator Donald Engen says the system is safe, but some controllers must work a day of overtime a week. However, that should be ending soon. My goal in February is to have 14,300 uh, air traffic controllers. We will meet that goal when we get there, and when we have those people trained, I look to next June to having that problem under full control. 
There were 16,000 controllers working before 11,400 of them struck in August 1981. They were members of the Professional Air Traffic Controllers Organization, PATCO. The top PATCO official in Dallas-Fort Worth at the time says supervisors haven't changed their tough management style. He also says the workload is greater because airlines are busier. They're going to pack their schedule as, as much as they're allowed to. And those things uh, create, a, create a difficulty for the controller. Is the more airplanes you get, the busier you get. Uh, and again, you're spending six hours before in front of that radar scope rather than four. Uh, it makes your life kind of miserable. There is no controller's union now, but there is a movement to affiliate with the American Federation of Government Employees. One controller says joining another union is inevitable because he says history is repeating itself. Brad Watson, Channel 8 News. Air traffic controllers gave Santa a straight-in approach at Love Field today. Santa parked his sleigh at the gate at gate 6 and came inside the terminal to the delight of a group of waiting youngsters. Well, most of them were delighted. Santa's visit was sponsored by Muse Air and the Dallas Park Department. And yes, that is Dallas Mayor Pro Tem Annette Strauss undoubtedly asking Santa for shorter council agendas and fewer controversial zoning cases. Santa's going to need a little snow around here to land his sleigh. For right. real. For real, yeah. When he comes back Christmas Eve, we will try to get some. But don't bet big money on it. We're going to have some cooler weather, though, and some rain by the middle of the week. And I'll tell you about that next. him a Merry Christmas with gift classics from Hager, Arrow, and Joskies. Among his favorites, Arrow's Brigade fitted sport shirts and pullovers, with Hager's expandomatic slacks that stretch with his every move. For the look of a suit and the versatility of separates, it's Hager's pinstripe jacket, vest, and pants. Added over dress shirt, Hager and Arrow, just two of the names that give him that Christmas feeling at Joskies. Joskies, make I always like to grow things. Sam and I started out doing lawns. With an ad in the Southwestern Bell Yellow Pages. Yeah, things went so well, we started growing shrubs and flowers, too. Put it in our ad. Then we grew trees. Told people here. <laughs> yeah, thanks to Sam's Yellow Pages ad. And my green thumb, we've grown something we can really be proud of. <laughs> you mean the new orchard out back? No, <laughs> the business, Sam, the business. The Southwestern Bell Yellow Pages. Because nobody's in business to grow smaller. Well, all in a, all, a pretty nice day today. The clouds we had hung in a little more than we expected, so temperatures didn't get into the 70s, but even the 60s was nice. Uh, and I think we'll see more of the same tomorrow and then cool off a bit on Tuesday. This is the satellite early this morning. Last little line of showers that had moved through the Dallas-Fort Worth area last night was into Arkansas and Louisiana. Well, let's roll the sequence of satellite pictures, see those showers move off. There were high clouds and patches of clouds that came across today, but for the most part, not much activity except some high clouds out west. But tonight, there are low clouds. Remember, this is heat-sensitive infrared photography, so when the cloud temperatures and the ground temperature is quite similar, we just don't see the clouds showing up. But there is a line of cloudiness from South Texas up to around Stephenville, just south of Dallas-Fort Worth between here and Waco, and then out to the Tyler area. Let's go ahead and put the fronts in. That front's gone stationary in southeast Texas. And that will set up an overrunning situation. So look for the clouds to return with southerly winds and continue to be a problem for the next day or so. We do have traveler's advisories for dense fog along the Texas coast tonight. And the upper flow from the southwest to the northeast. Probably not much effect for us for a day or so. Eventually, that will bring some Pacific moisture overhead. And when that happens, we'll have a chance for some more rain. 10 o'clock map from around the country. You can see there's still some rain shower activity in southeast Texas, portions of Louisiana, and up through the Tennessee and almost into the Ohio valleys. Snow is moving out of southern Wyoming and northern Colorado into the Plain states tonight. That's ahead of this upper level disturbance. Now, the main energy of that will pass to our north. Even so, it will bring some moisture across with it, and that's where we think we'll have that chance for showers. Let me step back. You can see there are some, a few showers off the tip of southern Florida tonight. Might be one or two of those tomorrow, but generally open weather is expected in the Miami area. That, of course, for the Cowboys. 54 degrees, humidity 77%, barometer rising from 30.13. Winds are out of the south now at 6 miles an hour. There's been no rain since midnight, but before midnight, about 7 tenths of an inch at DFW Airport, and some heavier amounts around parts of the area. An inch and a tenth at Navarro uh, Mills Reservoir. There was an inch and a tenth up at Decatur. 1.2 inches at Bowie in Montague County. Three-tenths of an inch at Denison Dam. Four-tenths of an inch from our weather watcher out uh, in Greenville. 
six tenths of an inch. That's the report from over in Van Zandt County. Downtown Dallas had 70 hundredths, 60 hundredths in Fort Worth, generally from three quarters of an inch to right a little bit over an inch. That was with the rain last night. We won't see any rain for a couple of days. 62 degrees for the high today. 49 was the low. There are the normals, the records, and here's what it'll look like at 7 o'clock tomorrow morning. Low clouds up over our area and likely crossing the Red River into the eastern portions of Oklahoma and Arkansas. And with the clouds, temperatures will stay up overnight, 47 for a low. Clouds may break a bit by noon, 53 front on the way. We'll see southerly or southwesterly winds in the morning hours. By 5 o'clock, our highest temperature likely will have already been passed. We'll be at 64 with clouds and a northerly wind. And then on Tuesday, the big change, 42 to 49 is all with northerly winds, cloud cover, rain, and even some freezing rain possible out west. Increasing clouds tonight, variable clouds tomorrow with a chance for showers Tuesday and Wednesday. Clearing on Thursday, then partly sunny on Friday with a high about 70. Six to 10 day outlooks for normal temperatures through the Christmas holidays, 55 to 60 lows, 35 to 40. Above normal precipitation, right now it doesn't look like snow, but gosh, that's a ways away and we yeah. can keep trying. Well, in Texas, we're used to not having a white Christmas, right? Right. But for a panda, snow is not only for Christmas, it's a natural habitat. And coming up next on the update, a special Christmas treat for some visiting pandas from China. Now we find out if we're good enough. The Momentum Banks. Monday's the day to shop Sanger Harris Red Apple Day. We're crunching into prices with tasty 20% savings on our entire stock of toys. Save 25% on all Mrs. Robes. Save 25% on all young men's sweaters and outerwear. Save 25% on all box Christmas cards and Christmas wrapping paper. And save 50% on all already reduced Mrs. Sportswear from Calvin Klein classification. And that's just the beginning. Be there Monday because prices go back up Tuesday. It's Sanger Harris Red Apple Day. Monday only. It's delicious. Nothing unusual about a Christmas party at the zoo, but this weekend in San Francisco, the zoo pandas did have something very different at their party. Instead of the usual munchies, the pandas were given a gift of snow, real snow, trucked in from the Sierra Nevada mountains. The snow was shoveled into the pandas' pen so they could feel at home. See, they're from China, and in fact, they will soon be going back to China, and their snow, they were on loan for the Summer Olympics. Maybe we can borrow some of it. Well, that would be great. That's our show for tonight. Thanks for watching. Dale is next. Good night. teams have a playoff spot. The Cowboys decide tomorrow who that 10th team will be. I'm Dale Hansen, and again, we do thank you for watching us tonight. Cowboys play in Miami tomorrow night. W uh, win there, the Cowboys are a playoff team again. Lose there, then the Giants will be. Giants still have a chance because Washington put the Cardinals out. It was 13-7 Redskins in the second quarter. Watch the throw by Joe Theismann to Calvin Muhammad. It covers 60 yards. It's a perfect throw, and Muhammad has been an outstanding find for that team. John Riggins took it in two plays later to make it 20-7. It was 23-7 at the half. Third quarter, Neil Lomax finds Roy Green open over the middle. This play covers 75 yards. 
This is a great combination the Cardinals have, and they made it work the third and the fourth quarter. It's 26-20. Jim Hannafin's ball club has a chance to win it now late in the fourth quarter. Here comes Lomax to Roy Green again. The extra point made it 27-26. But Washington had one more chance to get back into it. This time, Feisman goes to Art Monk. 102 catches. It's an NFL record for the year for Art Monk, and this one on third and 18 to set up a Mark Mosley field goal. Mosley hit it. He's outstanding under pressure. Hit it from 39 yards away to make it 29 to 27. Neil O'Donoghue had a chance to win it with a 50-yarder of his own at the end, but he missed it. Doesn't surprise a lot of people. Washington wins the NFC East. Detroit Lions season is over, and the coaching career of Monty Clark in Detroit might be too. Bears appear to be in better shape for the playoffs than we thought a week ago. Have Greg Landry at quarterback now. This pass to Willie Galt, and Galt turns it into a 55-yard touchdown. Greg Landry did throw three interceptions, but the Chicago Bears, with that great defense of theirs, have a chance in the playoffs now. 12 sacks to tie a league record, a season record total of 72 sacks. Monty Clark says that he's glad the season is over. Green Bay beat Minnesota. Boy, the Vikings went south on less tackle, didn't they? 38 to 14. And Kansas City's uh, team is finishing extremely strong. John McAdick's outfit beating San Diego 42-21. Cleveland beat Houston. The Oilers finished with a record of 3 and 13 this year. And Atlanta beat Philadelphia. Now the Eagles can move to Phoenix. Cincinnati Bengals end the year winning 8 of 11 and probably thought they had a playoff spot after the game with Buffalo. Ken Anderson, the quarterback, his first start since November 11. Goes to Chris Collinsworth over the middle. They scored one play later. It put Cincinnati in front 14 to 7. It was a great day for Ken Anderson back starting again. This one goes to Rodney Holman. Watch the effort by this man. Runs through two tacklers at the three-yard line. Gets in the end zone to make it 21 to 7. Throw another touchdown pass, Ken Anderson, make it 28-7. As Cincinnati went on to beat Buffalo, 52-21, probably thought they had a playoff spot. The Bengals needed the L.A. Raiders to beat Pittsburgh in L.A., and that would put the Bengals in. The Steelers play well on the West Coast for some reason. A lot of teams don't. This is Walter Abercrombie. Turns this little screen pass into a 59-yard run that you would think would be a touchdown, only to be dragged down from behind at the one. Frank Pollard took it in on the next play, though, and the Steelers were out in front 10-0. It's 13-0, fourth quarter, fourth down. Watch this one. Doki Williams, Williams catches the ball, but he's out of bounds. The referee gave him the touchdown anyway to make it 13-7. The Raiders' last chance and Cincinnati's last chance is picked off by Donnie Shell. Steelers a playoff team. The Bengals are out, and the Raiders now will play in Seattle. Tampa Bay beat the Jets 41-21. James Wilder had a big day there. New England's Craig James ran for 138 yards as the Patriots beat the Colts 16-10. And with one game to play, the Giants will be watching. The Giants lose their last two games, lose yesterday to the Saints and still a playoff team at 9-7 if the Cowboys lose tomorrow night. The only touchdown in that game, the pass there to Hokie Gaijon, and the Giants can still get in. What a strange, strange year it has been in the NFL. a piece of news for you from 7-Eleven. When you need cash fast, just take any banking card to participating 7-Elevens. Now your neighborhood 7-Eleven has the moneymaker ATM. It takes any card. Hey, that's sure convenient on a Saturday afternoon. So if you need cash fast, remember 7-Eleven. Use any card. Get cash anytime at 7-Eleven. Monday's the day to shop Sanger Harris Red Apple Day. We're crunching into prices with tasty 20% savings on our entire stock of toys. Save 25% on all Mrs. Robes. Save 25% on all young men's sweaters and outerwear. Save 25% on all box Christmas cards and Christmas wrapping paper. And save 50% on all already reduced Mrs. Sportswear from Calvin Klein classification. And that's just the beginning. Be there Monday because prices go back up Tuesday. It's Sanger Harris Red Apple Day. Monday only. It's delicious. It's Christmas on the farm, we're coming home. Grandma's fixing all the things we love. What a feeling of elation at this blessed celebration. Merry Christmas from the Dairy Farm families of Associated Milk Producers. 
NFL playoffs starting as the high school playoffs in the state will end. Highland Park season ending yesterday in Odessa, but that team played two weeks longer than most people thought they could and thought they would. Highland Park did take that opening kickoff and went 70 yards yesterday. John Stallenworth's touchdown made it 7-0 Highland Park then. But Permian has a lot of talented players. This is quarterback Alton Holloway who goes to Dal Watson. The little pass there made it 7-7 at halftime. Stayed that way a long time, and Permian was actually winning on the tiebreakers. They're just trying to run it out as Dal Watson bowls in, just keeps bouncing off people. Second of three touchdowns for him. It was 20 to 7 the final. Permian puts Highland Park out. They finished the year 12 and 3. But listen to Highland Park quarterback John Stalin work. Uh, physically, I was a little tired. Mentally, I wasn't. I, I wanted to win so bad, but it's just, you know, it's, it's the Lord's will and His will be done. And He wanted us to lose, and so I can't, you know, disagree with that. They have a tough defense. I don't know about their offense, but their defense is good. And they're going to, if they, next week, the team they play is going to have a tough time against them. Nice kid, isn't it? It's taken Dennison 19 years to have a playoff team, and they're staying to the end. We did a story on Dennis on Thursday. Man from Sweetwater called to get equal time, said he would call back when Sweetwater won. Well, he didn't have to call. Tony Brown scored two touchdowns to Dennison yesterday. They are 15-0 and 0 now. This was an impressive win. As they beat Sweetwater 31-7, to 7. they'll play Saturday at Baylor Stadium at 2.30 in Waco for a state championship. Here's a look at the team Dennison plays Saturday for the state title. Tom Bowles got a kid who can run on that team. This is Bubba Greeley. Now watch the way he takes the handoff in this next play. They did this a couple of times. Watch the quarterback goes behind him, gives it to Bubba Greeley, then he just breaks it up the field for about 25 more yards there. The kid also has some speed and some moves. Bubba Greeley yesterday runs for 291 yards. Nice move to the outside there. Scored three touchdowns as Tom Ball beat Gregory Portland 48-7. to Dennison, you've got your work ahead of you. And Dangerfield will play in Medina Valley Saturday night in Waco for the 3A state title. Dangerfield beat Vernon 14-7 yesterday, and it was a Dangerfield defense again that won it for them. Vernon got only six first downs in this ballgame, got only 89 yards of total offense, and turned it over a couple of times. As Dangerfield wins again, beat Vernon 14-7. Oklahoma's Mac Brown, the Sooners' offensive coordinator, is leaving there. Will be the head coach at Tulane now. Mac Brown's only 33 years old. This will be the eighth school he's coached at. He spent only one year in Norman, Oklahoma. Dallas Mavericks playing the Rockets in Houston last night without forward Mark McGuire, and what a good game this was. Look at the move by Jay Vincent. 32 points, nine rebounds for him last night. But at the other end of the floor, he had to guard Ralph Sampson, was giving up nine inches, and he put on a clinic. 38 points, 18 rebounds for Sampson. In the third quarter, Akeem Elijah on the other big man took over, ran off 10 straight points in the third quarter, and it was making it a big lead for the Rockets. But they come back again. Dale Ellis can hit that long three-point shot, did it there to close it to a four-point game. It went down to two. You see the time remaining on the clock, and then Mitchell Wiggins hit the basket to clinch it. Houston won at 117-115 last night, but Ralph Sampson was awesome. Well, you know, he did the right thing. He was he's trying to post me at any time. Uh, somebody set, someone seven four uh, posted in the middle. You know, he's a center. You know, they made a power forward out of, out of him. So there's not too much you can do. There's too, not too much any seven footer can do against him. So uh, especially when he gets hot like that, uh, he was just not much you can do. Uh, I just will get the ball in low and um, shots were going. What about playing against this Maverick team? You know, they make so much of a big deal by not having that big man, and you can see that it does hurt them inside when you how you can post up on someone like. Uh, Vincent, you got you give up uh, nine inches on him. Uh, well, yeah, yeah I, I, I can't control uh, who people get or where they go. I know I'm playing with Houston, and uh, uh, there's 23 teams in the NBA, and you have to play with what you get. <laughs> yeah, but it's a lot easier if you're 7-4. Rangers manager Doug Rader meets tomorrow with former Rangers catcher Jim Sundberg. Who would have believed that? Rader dumped Sundberg, now says only good things because the Rangers need to catch her. Rangers and Sunberg talking anyway about Sunberg playing in Arlington again. Jimmy, it has been my experience when a man dumps on you, you can't go back, and if you do, make sure you get it in writing. U.S. Davis Cup team in serious trouble with Sweden. Jimmy Connors playing Mats Wielander in the, in the uh, Davis Cup's first match. Connors is at the top of the screen. It is probably too slow for him on this clay court. Wielander won the Australian tournament and wins here because of mistakes like that by Connors. Missed the overhead slam. 6-1, 6-1, 6-3, the scores there. The world's best player, John McEnroe, had to get it even against Sweden's Henrik Sundstrom and couldn't do it. An American should probably cheer for the American team, but I find it impossible to cheer for John McEnroe anytime. Sundstrom beats McEnroe, and Sweden leads the U.S. team 2-0 in the best of five. They will play doubles tomorrow. 
Fort Worth's Gene Hatcher defended his world title in Fort Worth last night, but boxing's being criticized again as too brutal. American Medical Association has passed a resolution among its members calling for a ban on the sport at all levels in this country. And we'll talk about that next. It's a personal opinion, but I think the referee should think about stopping this fight and pass. I mean, this is not right. To keep fares low, some airlines cut back on service. Puppy! Oh. Not on Delta, where you enjoy great service on a great low fare. How about that movie, huh? Just give it a good spin. <laughs> and movies on selected Delta flights to California and Fort Lauderdale. Hello? So why fly an airline that's low on fares Puppy. and low on service? Fly Delta. Low, low fares and sky-high service. That's the Delta spirit. The two most exciting engines in the world are the Jaguar V12 that powers our race car and the Jaguar V12 that powers the smooth and silent Jaguar XJS. Here is V12 power wrapped in soft leather, paneled in rare wood, equipped in complete luxury. You can't buy our race car, but you can own the exciting Jaguar XJS, a blending of art and machine. Test drive the XJS at your Jaguar dealer. Capture the true spirit of Christmas on Kodak's most versatile color print film, Kodakolor VR200 film. Kodak, because time goes by. He's mentally retarded and cannot survive alone. Yet he was about to be turned out on the streets. News 8 reported on Jeffrey Simmons' flight, and phone calls poured in from viewers who wanted to help. A few days later, Jeffrey found a permanent home. Plus... There's definitely something wrong with the dolls. When a concerned parent called about suspicious dolls, News 8 commissioned lab tests that exposed the danger. Whether it affects one person or many, you can count on us. News 8. American Medical Association has called for a ban on boxing in this country, saying it's a brutal sport, serves no purpose, causes brain damage to all fighters, and this country shouldn't allow it. Dr. Kenneth Poole's a neurologist and supports the AMA, AMA's call for a ban on boxing. And Steve Crossan's a fight referee, has worked several title fights and doesn't. We're talking about this tonight, gentlemen, obviously, because the AMA is the one who brought it up. So, Dr. Poole, we will start with you. Make your case. Why should boxing be banned? The principal problem with boxing, I personally enjoy the sport in terms of watching it. I think very few people would disagree that boxing is a sport. It requires certain physical attributes, agility, tactics, etc. The problem is with other sports, let's take downhill skiing, if you run into a tree while you're going 70 miles an hour on skis, everyone can see the injuries. Everyone can see what happens to you. If you're in an auto wreck while racing cars, you can see the burns that occur. In boxing, the injuries are different. The injuries to the brain. You cannot see a broken brain like you can a leg. That's the reason that we have, using this technique, is a computerized analysis of brain activity. That abnormality, you see this patient's brain activity, this patient sustained a minor blow to the head, was not knocked out. That abnormality occurred a week later still. This patient was injured, had a brief loss of consciousness from being knocked out. This bottom map, you'll see these three pictures. The one on the bottom there is a measure of how abnormal this patient's brain activity is. This is a movie showing the patient's brain activity in response to a flash of light. This patient had a brief knockout lasting a few seconds four years prior to this evaluation. The point is that we cannot see these brain injuries. We can't see what has happened to the brain when you injure each time you get a blow to the head. And as the first patient showed us, that whitish yellow area is all abnormal in that patient. That is something that builds up. It accumulates in the br from brain injuries again and again and again, all even right. without knockouts. All right, all right. Well, let's go to you, Mr. Cross. And don't we have an obligation to protect the fighters here? Or, you, or, or you say you're doing that, I guess. Yes, of course we have an obligation to protect the boxers, Dale, and I think that uh, the people in boxing are making a very, very serious effort uh, to make the sport much, much safer than it has been in the past. Well, one of the most celebrated fights was the one you worked, and we used that going into the commercial break there, the, the Randall Cobb fight, Tex Cobb fight against Larry Holmes. The criticism was you didn't stop it. Even Tex Cobb, though, said that you, you handled it right. Well, I, uh, I feel very, very uh, secure in what I did on that particular evening. Uh, as it turns out, Randall is the sort of a boxer that uh, can take a much heavier punch than, than any other person that I've ever seen. 
And, uh, you know, I, didn't I won't tell you that I enjoyed seeing him taking those kinds of shots, but uh, he had never, never at any, any time during the bout was in danger of injury. And uh, uh, I had no, no alternative except to let the bout go on. Well, I take it, Dr. Poole, you don't agree with that. No, I, the, um, I think the point of disagreement here is that the ideal in boxing, when, you, when two people walk into the ring, the ideal you want to do is you want to knock out the man on the other side of the ring. With that in mind, the way what you do when you knock someone out, what you're doing is that you are delivering a sufficiently <coughs> severe blow to the brain that it stops working for a brief period of time. That's what a knockout is. The brain stops functioning normally. So that the ideal of the entire sport is to deliver brain injury. Steve, the, the, the argument has always been from most people that I've talked to about boxing is that there are injuries in other sports, so why pick on boxing? But isn't that the argument that the doctor makes is that the intent is injury in the sport of boxing, isn't it? The intent of boxing is not injury. I can assure you that, uh, that boxers have no more evil intent than uh, participants in, in many other sports, football, for example, uh, which are very heavy contact sports. Boxing, of course, is a contact sport, and it's, it's, a, it's a violent sport. Well, this is but Tony Dorsett getting knocked out here. Go ahead, gentlemen. And uh, I, I'm not here to tell you that boxing is not, is not a violent sport, that it's not a dangerous sport. But the but what ideal. I am, but the what ideal I am here to tell you is that uh, it is no more dangerous than, than many other sports. In fact, uh, I've got a study here in front of me that was, was done by the, uh, published in the Journal of the American Medical Association by their Council of, on Scientific Affairs. And it concludes just that, that boxing is a dangerous sport, but it's mo no more dangerous than many other sports accepted by our society. This, this particular study also says that a call for the abolition of boxing is not at all realistic, that what should be done by the medical community is to work to make the sport safer, not simply to condemn it. I think that the principal difference here is a definition of what is the purpose. Certainly football is a violent sport in terms of lots of contact going on. Um, the difference is that football years ago recognized that their purpose, the ideal of what they were trying to achieve there was to move a ball back and forth and that injuring the head wasn't leading to that end. And therefore they developed extravagant headgear to protect the brains of their players, if you will. The abnormalities which I just saw, I would not want to allow anyone I knew to accumulate those kinds of injuries to their brain over and over and over again in continuous bouts. And you, if you continue to deliver major blows which affect the ability of the patient or the individual to function, you're going to be adding those kinds of injuries on. All right, a final question for both of you. Again, Dr. Poole, you started first. I'll let Steve Cross and have the final word. Uh, is this AMA proposal actually going to accomplish anything? And certainly, is it going to accomplish a ban on boxing in this country? And again, Dr. Poole, I'll start with you. All right. I think that it's unlikely that we're going to see a complete ban on boxing. I think most of us really would like to see a change in the sport so that we avoid any brain injury and can allow the skills of the boxers to be used. Steve Crossan? I would, uh, I, I would be uh, very, very surprised if this led to any sort of uh, serious effort to, to ban the sport of boxing. Uh, but I, I continue to be... Uh, upset by this, this intermixing of, 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 of the, uh, the medical issues involved here and the so-called moral issues involved. I get uh, very suspect when I hear a group uh, opposing things on moral grounds as if they are the moral custodians of our society. I think we could go forever. I got to cut you both off. I, I knew this would happen, but again, I, I appreciate the time from, from both of you. Thank you very much. Dr. Ken Poole and Steve Cross. Thank, Thank you again. Cowboys are in Miami tonight, play the Dolphins there tomorrow, and again, a win there would mean another playoff game. What a week this has been for this team. Have a chance, then they don't. Then they do again. And now to use their line, they control their own destiny. That story's next. It's all up to us now. If we go out and play the kind of football that we're capable of, love, we've got a great shot of being in the playoffs. If we go out and screw around, we're out of it, and we can uh, sit back and watch everybody else have fun. Crash on the field, but Ed and I are really good friends, aren't we? We like to work out in Russell warm-ups because Russell can take anything we dish out, right? You get dirty? No problem. It washes great. Russell's tough because they make stuff for the NFL, uniforms and practice clothes, and they make warm-ups and sweatshirts and pants for you the same way, Ed. 
Ed. Ed. See, Russell even looks good hanging in the closet. Russell, the experience Ed. shows. More than telephone service, the Southwestern Bell Network is the messenger of the information age. We needed a high-speed data link to connect the new computer center to our worldwide communication network, and we needed it in a hurry. Southwestern Bell Telephone's quick response put us online and on time. To put information into motion, call Southwestern Bell Telephone. We're online with the future. Burger King presents eight simple words that can change your life. I'll never eat a fried soda pounder again. Eight simple words and you're on your way to Burger King for one of our double burgers. A quarter pound of beef, flame broiled, not fried. Quarter pound double hamburger, double cheeseburger, or bacon double cheeseburger. America, you never have to eat a fried quarter pounder again. Never. 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 Last year, car makers spent a record $1 billion in advertising just to tell you how wonderful their cars are. Fortunately, there's a more objective opinion, car owners. According to a recent survey, of all cars in America, import or domestic, Subaru ranks second only to Mercedes in customer satisfaction. And that's the kind of advertising money can't buy. In Dallas, visit Stately Subaru, and in Irving, visit Frank Parra Subaru. Dallas Cowboys are in Miami tonight. The game tomorrow on Channel 8, and it means a great deal. We thought it would, then we thought it wouldn't, and now we know it does. It's been that kind of a year for that team, and those who follow the Cowboys, Jerry Orr's report. Last Sunday's loss to Washington was absolute agony for the Cowboys. They failed in a crucial game they could have won and should have won. Oh, well, gosh, it's, you know, I, would not, I don't know how to rate a game, you know. It was a disappointing game for us. So. Something right now I just can't explain. Um, we really wanted it bad, and uh, then we went out and showed how bad we wanted it, but things just didn't fall the way we expected to, the way we wanted to. And it's, it's really hurting the feeling right now. If you sleep, you know, after, you know, we had them 21-6 the first half, and you just come out and, you know, just... There's not much you want to say or can't say. Now the Cowboys needed help in their search for the playoffs. If San Francisco beat Los Angeles Friday night, the Cowboys were in control of their destiny once again. Hopefully, uh, when game time rolls around, then uh, we're going to prepare ourselves all week for the, with the, in the back of our minds that it's going to be for a shot in the playoffs if we can beat Miami. Oh, yeah, it's going to keep us in the playoffs one way or another, uh, I think. You know, it just depends on what happens on Sundays, but we're going to look at it just like, you know, we need to win this game and, you know, go through all week working hard like we did last week. We should have won last week, but uh, things just didn't bounce our ways. We're playing this week? Yes. Miami Dolphins. All right, just checking from Miami. Monday night, <laughs> Nan Eastern. All right, always both. While Dexter was off on another planet, most of the Cowboys gathered at the home of Ron Spring. They waited and watched and cheered for the 49ers. San Francisco built an early lead, 14 to three, in the first quarter, but the Rams fought back and trailed by only four at the half, 17 to 13. Then late in the fourth quarter. LA's Jeff Kemp was sacked by Gary Johnson for a safety. The 49ers had won, and the agony had turned to ecstasy. an opportunity if uh, we're going down there trying to do everything we can to beat Miami and get a shot in the playoffs and go on from there. It's been a weird year, but you know, it's all on the line Monday night. There's no tomorrow after Monday night or either that or it's next year, but I think we're ready and you know, we've been preparing real well. We had an extra day this week, so we'll have to wait and see on Monday night, see what goes on. I hope our offense moves the ball and I think, you know, we can play them pretty well defensively. That's good. Uh, Jerry, it's all up to us and, uh, you know, we're excited about it. Last week, eliminate the mistakes and uh, come back and be in the playoffs. Uh, if 
put us in a situation right now where we know what we have to do. It's something like a, it's almost like a playoff situation, the game in itself, you know, because if you lose, you're out of it. If we win, we still got some some work to do. So uh, it's good to know that we still have some life left. You got you got that second chance again. Now it's all up to the Cowboys Monday night. Yeah, I don't know if it's a second chance. It might be a third or fourth chance the way this year's gone. But yeah, it's, it's all in our it's in our hands right now, and uh, that's all you can ask for. Last game of the season, uh, we control our own destiny. Well, it hasn't really uh, hasn't really been our year up until now. We're finally starting to get some breaks. Maybe uh, maybe they'll maybe they'll keep going our way for a while. Well, we've got a big break. Uh, you know, it's all up to us now. If we go out and play the kind of football that we're capable of, love, we've got a great shot of being in the playoffs. If we go out and screw around, we're out of it, and we can uh, sit back and watch everybody else have fun. So it's a big opportunity, and we've got to take advantage of it. And I think everybody's confident and optimistic that we can pull it off. Uh, it's going to be a tough game, but. Uh, Cowboys don't have the talent and tenacity of yesteryear's team, but finally, they do have unity for the first time in a long time. And now, they have a mission in Miami. Jerry Ower, Channel 8 Sports at DFW Airport. This 84 Cowboys team has been tough to figure. There was a time when I thought they were a playoff team and should be. There was a week or two when I thought they were a playoff team and didn't deserve to be. And now they might not be a playoff team and they should be. Cowboys appear to be playing well enough now to make it and play well when they do. But we find out in Miami tomorrow night if they can. We'll have live reports from there tomorrow at 6 and again after the game. So until tomorrow, for everyone who's been a part of this one, I'm Dale Hansen. We do thank you for watching. Good night. Dallas-Fort Worth, ending its broadcast schedule. WFAA-TV is licensed to broadcast in the public interest, and we appreciate your comments regarding our broadcast schedule. WFAA-TV is a Belo Broadcasting Company.